When I heard that uh, this was being live streamed on the web, I was reminded of an old friend of mine who was a very nervous public speaker. And he was once asked to give a talk about a book that he had recently written, and he went to his doctor to ask for sedatives that would calm his concerns. The doctor asked how many would be in the audience, and when Ray told him there would be 50 in attendance, the doctor said, in that case I will give you 51 Valium, one for yourself and one for each of the audience. <laughs> thank you, Jane, for your kind introduction, uh, and thank you, Catherine, uh, for providing this menu for us today. I am also grateful uh, to you and your staff at the Beaton Institute for other reasons that I shall explain in a minute. But first of all, I want to thank uh, Mike Hunter of CBU Press, not only for publishing this book, but also for all his hard work and assistance in preparing it for publication. Two months ago, he arranged a launch of the book at seven locations in Scotland. And another book as well as this one, uh, a book about the Highland Clearances. And in doing so, he suffered travel fatigue and the idiosyncrasies of eccentric scribblers, but he proved to be a wonderful ambassador for Cape Breton University. And the fact that these books were published in the country where many vic victims of the clearances settled was much appreciated over there. I also wish to thank Dr. Michael Linkletter of St. Vex University for his valuable role as co-editor of this book. Unfortunately, he cannot be with us today since he is on sabbatical leave. Michael is chair of the Department of Celtic Studies at St. of X, a position that has been filled by some distinguished Gaelic scholars. One of them was Sister Margaret MacDonnell. I'm delighted she's with us. Now, one of the venues that we visited in Scotland on, on this trip was the Aras Centre at Portree in the Isle of Skye. And there's a bookshop there, and before our presentation started, I was looking at interesting books that were displayed on a table. And a big fellow standing close to me pointed to one of the books and said, is this the book that you are promoting tonight? And I looked at the book and read the title, which said, Grumpy Old Geezer. <laughs> I then looked up at this guy and recognized him as a fellow who had been at school with me. We knew him as Roddy Daft, probably because he was smarter than the rest of us. Now, at another occasion, a fellow asked if I was the John McPherson who has a number of books listed on the Amazon website. The question puzzled me, and when I got back home to my computer, I googled McPherson Amazon. And when I found it, there were some titles that I would love to lay claim to, such as Women Are From Venus, Men Are Idiots, <laughs> McPherson's Marriage Album, and When Bad Things Happen to Stupid People. <laughs> but there were others that I couldn't possibly write or even read like McPherson's Sport and Fitness Manual. McPherson goes to church, and especially one called Great Sex After Fifty and Other Outlandish Lies About Getting Older. <laughs> now, the John McPherson who wrote those is a popular American cartoonist. He is also a tall, handsome dude and a distinguished public speaker who doesn't need Valium. I'm checking Ancestry.com to see if we are related, but it's highly unlikely. <laughs> but to get back to the book of today, it was the Beaton Institute that paved the way for it, and for that I am deeply indebted to them. Three years ago they asked me to look at a wonderful catalogue of articles from the famous Gaelic newspaper Machtala, 
The catalogue had been compiled by K. MacDonald, and browsing through it persuaded me to start reading Mahtala, and it soon became an obsession. I was particularly fascinated by the fact that many of the contributors were anonymous. As an aside, I noticed that the Cape Breton Post has recently stopped identifying its reporters, but I suspect it has something to do with labor relations rather than reticence. Contributors to Maktala used initials or pen names or no identification at all. The person who wrote the contents of this book used the initials DBB. One of the pen names that intrigued me was Peggy Fappach, which is the Gaelic for Peggy from Pabe. Now, Pabe is a small island between North Uist and Harris, the two Hebridean islands where I spent the early years of my own life. But it was obvious from the writings that Peggy Fappach was a man and that he had connections with North Uist. I later learned that his identity was revealed in a letter from the editor of Maktala in October 1903 to another distinguished Gaelic writer, Alexander MacLean Sinclair. And he wrote, Peggy Fappach's real name is Dan McPherson, a young man who is foreman in my office. Another of those intrusive North U.S. McPhersons. Jonathan G. McKinnon was the editor of Maktala, and like MacLean Sinclair, he made an outstanding contribution to Gaelic literature and publication. As a young boy, he suffered ill health and was not able to attend school regularly. While confined to the house, he spent a lot of time acquiring information about his Gaelic-speaking ancestors. Eventually, his health improved and he completed his high school education at Sydney Academy where he became editor of the school magazine. And this helped to fulfill his ambition to produce a newspaper in Gaelic, which he did in May 1892 at the age of 22. Initially, it was a small four-page paper, and he called it Maktala, which means the echo. It was entirely in Gaelic, even the advertising, except when the language lacked vocabulary to describe modern commodities of those days, such as felt hats, stoves, bicycles, and molasses. Here's an example of one of the ads. It's shown on page 160 of the book, and it says, Hatjene fúl vá le troch stamek, ni KDC fúl vá le stamek gwanag sa horst in English, that means a bad stomach doesn't produce good blood. KDC will produce good blood by cleansing the stomach and putting it in good order. A free sample available on request from KDC Company, New Glasgow, Nova Scotia, Canada. And then there's a line that gives the ad a modern spin. It says, when you ask for it, name this paper. <laughs> Sounds like a political plug. Another ad, and it's one of the ones that you'll see in one of the pages uh, up here of Maktala. And this ad says, Angus MacDonald, Merchant, Sydney. It has flour, he has flour, sugar, tea, tobacco, oats, grass, and many other items available at a cheap price. Must have been the Walmart of its day. <laughs> I presume that the grass was hay rather than cannabis. When Maktala started, the yearly subscription was 50 cents. And in its second year, the layout was increased from four to eight pages, and the subscription raised to a dollar. During the third year, the subscription list rose to 1,100 and later to 1,400. But even this peak was not adequate to support the expenses of publication. In its seventh year, 1899, some of the editor's friends rallied around him and formed a printing and publishing company, issuing a thousand shares 
at ten dollars a share, but to plunder a pun, the writing was on the wall. There was never enough subscribers, and some of those who did subscribe were slow to pay. The editor used to remind the delinquent sub subscribers in a column entitled Etzen Fi, Those Who Paid. And one contributor suggested that a column headed Etzen Nacht Fi, Those Who Haven't Paid, might be more effective. <laughs> the editor didn't take his advice but continued to remind his readers about payment, and this persuaded one irate subscriber to compose a song comparing the whining Machtala to the more genteel casket. He wrote, I think it's shameful that you are reproaching the gales with a persistent rant shouting for payment of Machtala. Look at the casket, so modest, mannerly, and quiet. You never hear it yelling for payment, as that rascal Machtala does. It has been coming to us for fifty years in good order, and it has never asked for payment, like the miserly Machtala. Now, during the lifespan of Machtala, McKinnon was tireless in seeking more readership. In 1898, he put this message of appeal in the paper. I quote, On this side of the Atlantic, there is only one Gallic paper, Machtala. That is not all. It is the only Gallic paper in the world. Therefore, shouldn't every person who reads Gallic subscribe to this paper? If you have respect for the language of your ancestors <clears throat> and you want it to survive, you will send for Machtala with the first money you have to spare. Machtala is published every Saturday. Community news and news of the world at large are told intelligently in few words and as truthfully as you will find in any paper. Machtala takes no sides in politics. It doesn't seek to impose its own opinions on anyone. It will not begin to criticize anybody. It leaves wisdom and folly of that kind to other papers. End of quote. Now, I'm not fully convinced that Machtala was as impartial and apolitical as Jonathan McKinnon claimed, especially when it came to traditional conflicts, friction, and distrust. When the paper published a short history of the Campbell clan, a reader, and I need not tell you what his surname was, sent an indignant letter to the editor saying that the account had only portrayed the bright side of the picture. Now, being married to a Campbell, I hesitate to quote what he said, but having mentioned it, I suppose I have no alternative. In his onslaught, he wrote, The Campbells raised themselves by trickery and deception, and by setting stumbling blocks before other free-hearted clans, such as the MacDonalds, the MacLeans, and the MacGregors. It was, of course, a MacDonald who wrote this. By 1901-02, McKinnon had to make the paper bi-weekly, as it had been when it started a decade earlier. Subscriptions were inadequate, production costs were rising, and advertising was in decline. And in the last issue, on June 24, 1904, McKinnon wrote a sad farewell to Machtala and its readers. He said this, To produce Machtala every two weeks would require at least 2,000 subscribers. The paper could easily have that even if there were no other Gallic readers except those in Cape Breton. But when this number cannot be found throughout the length and breadth of the world, we can reach no other conclusion than that the Gales do not want a Gallic paper and that they are content to be classed as the only Christian race in the world who will not pay to keep up a paper in their own language. A strong indictment indeed. But rather than dwell on the decline of Gallic readers and subsequently Gallic speakers, let me revert to the birth of Machtala and the main subject of this talk. In June 1892, on the front page of the third issue 
of Mahtala, DBB, the Reverend Duncan Black Blair, extended this welcome to the paper. He said, I am delighted to see a new Gaelic newspaper. I hope it will be supported by the Gaels in this new country so that it will respond to the Gaelic on the other side of the vast ocean that separate us, separates us from the land of the Bens, where our ancestors lived of old and where some of us were also reared. For a whole year following this letter, Blair enthusiastically supplied the publisher with prose and poetry, but at the beginning of June 1893, he wrote another letter to the editor saying, I have been ill for a fortnight. I am weak, weak, and I cannot put writing or ideas together. Consequently, I cannot write anything for Mahtala until I feel better. And before the letter reached its, his, its destination, he was interred in his grave at Lagan Cemetery, not far from his Garden of Eden church in Picto. And in the next issue of the paper, Jonathan McKinnon paid him this tribute. He said, The Reverend D.B. Blair was born in the county of Argyll in 1815 on the first day of the last month of summer. He first went to school when he was eight years old, and within a year he was able to read the Bible in both English and Gaelic. When he was still quite young, his father moved to Lagan in Badenoch, and when he was 20 years old, he went to Edinburgh University. He was licensed to preach in 1844, and two years later he came to Nova Scotia. He preached at Barney's River for the first time on September 22, 1846, and a month later he was installed in that parish where he stayed until the time of his death. He preached more than 5,000 sermons, and his achievements were deemed formidable. He was an excellent scholar with expertise in Hebrew, Greek, Latin, and English, but he was particularly dedicated to writing in Gaelic. He left behind him a large collection of writings, including a Gaelic grammar and the Psalms of David in Gaelic. We hope that they will be looked after with care and that they will be published before long. Maktala had no friend who gave it a more hearty welcome or did more to keep it alive than Dr. Blair. When we look over the issues of the past year, we see that there is hardly any without a contribution from his pen, the Highland Clearances, the Brahan Seer, and his other historical accounts appealed greatly to those who read them. More than 20 years later, they appealed greatly to me as I read them here in this room on the Mahtala and, and on the Mahtala website set up by Sol Mor Ostek, the Gaelic College in Skye, where Jonathan McKinnon's forebears had lived. The title of the book, Parting Prophecy Poetry, refers to the clearances, the predictions of the Brian Seer who foretold the clearances, and a selection of Blair's poems. But it also includes articles that he wrote about his travels and other topics that interested him. Someone asked me if the alliterative Gaelic title Falkru Fashniach Filiach is a collection of Gaelic F words. <laughs> but I had to assure him that if that were the case, I would be forever haunted by the ghost of a Presbyterian minister. He wrote 18 articles about the Highland Clearances. Nine of them were about the evictions in Sutherland, where the savage Kildonan clearances of 1813 are being commemorated this year, and where we had the inaugural launch of this book. The most infamous villain of the Sutherland clearances was a landlord's lackey called Patrick Seller. And this is a translation of an extract from what Blair wrote about him and his sidekicks. I quote, Patrick Seller was detested by the people for the awful work that he did. When he approached any village, the people shook with fear and ran out of his way like mice before a cat. The women went into hysteria and frenzy. One woman went so much out of her mind 
that she never regained her senses. When she saw someone whom she did not recognize, she would yell with a fearful screech, It's cellar, it's cellar. A complaint against cellar was eventually sent to the Duchess of Sutherland, and he was brought to court in Inverness before the Red Lords in 1816. But he suffered no penalty. Not many more than a quarter of the witnesses were called, and those who were had the least to say against him. The jury consisted of sheep farmers, lawyers, and landlords. The witnesses were questioned in Gaelic, but translated evidence is not as strong or as effective as direct evidence of the language of the court, especially if the interpreter is incompetent or dishonest, and if he doesn't translate correctly or justly. The outcome was that Seller was freed because the jurors did not find him guilty. And he goes on, although the court did not declare him guilty, he was guilty in the eyes and opinion of the people. To this day, his name is putrid in Sutherland. Not only that, there are old people at Barney's River who find his name loathsome and disgusting. There are old women at Barney's River who can dance with ardor and mirth and who sing a humorous, satirical and vituperative ditty composed about cellar in Sutherland. You would think their heads would hit the rafters or the ceiling as they leap and spring from on the floor while singing like thrushes in the bushes on a May morning. And the song that they sing is translated, Oh the black tinker, oh the black tinker, oh the black tinker who raised the price of the land. I saw a dream and I wouldn't mind seeing it again. If I saw it while I wake, it would give me a day of mirth, a good fire burning, with Roy in the middle of it, young in prison, and iron shackles around cellar's bones. The grandfather of this, these women, he says, was born in 1733, a decade before the Battle of Culloden. He was a dear forester for the old Duke of Sutherland, Duke William. He never put trousers on his thighs. His house was put on fire and his family had a skirmish with the bailiffs. His daughter, Big Jane, ripped up the sheriff's summons with her teeth. She had a daughter, Little Jane, and when her mother's brother, Alistair the Fiddler, saw a constable's stick hitting the head of the sixteen-year-old girl, he jumped in and got a blow on the top of his own head. He had a lump on his skull for the rest of his life. After that, the elderly man John Sutherland was imprisoned in Dornoch. The Duchess released him, but he had to leave the country and go to America. When he mentions America, he, he means Canada, of course. He came to, this is Sutherland, Sutherland came to Barney's River in Picto, where he lived until he reached the age of 105. And in this country, he was known as Patachineli, the old man of the killed. Now, Duncan Blair was a clergyman, but he was also critical of the clergy who acted as minions of the landlords during the clearances. In another reference to John Sutherland of the Kilt, he said that John and his two sons and three daughters came to Barney's River in 1820. This is what he wrote. Angus Mackay, who was an elder at Barney's River, was married to Muriel, the eldest daughter of Kilted John. He came from the district of Klein in Sutherland, where Mr. Walter Ross was a minister. He was often heard telling stories about this minister, who was more interested in recreation than in preaching. At certain times after the sermons, he would give advance notice to the congregation, saying, If tomorrow is wet, we will have a prayer meeting in the church. If it is dry, we will be chasing the foxes. Then Blair added, The ministers that the patron foisted on the people of Sutherland against their will were very mediocre and run of the mill. Therefore, they were of little benefit to the people. They allowed the big red fox, that's the landlord, that they should be pursuing to ruin the flock and rip it apart. Now, in my own island of 
North Uist, a minister who had supported the landlord and his factor at the time of the clearances, was rewarded with the tenure of one of the most fertile stretches of land, but you could get access to it only if there was a low tide. His church was three miles away, and when a high tide was imminent, he would shorten the service. He became known as the preacher of the low tide sermon. The worst clearance in Uist was in a district called Solas, which later became the name of a district here in Cape Breton. But the name is no longer used here. It was changed to Woodbine. Now, why a good Gaelic place name was replaced by the name of a brand of cigarettes is an unsolved mystery. When I pass the Woodbine sign, which I do almost daily, it strengthens my resolve never to smoke again. But if it was a sign saying solace, I would probably buy a box of cigars. This is an excerpt from Duncan Blair's article on the North U.S. evictions. In the year 1849, Lord MacDonald cleared 600 or 700 people from the North U.S. district of Salas. The people pleaded for a short delay until they could sell their cattle and other possessions without suffering a loss when the summer sales came round. But they didn't get a hearing or a response to their request. They were moved out of their homes. Everything that they had was confiscated between cattle, crops, and peats, and their furniture was thrown outside. There was a certain man there who was a weaver and who had a wife and nine children. This man's furniture was thrown out and the tweed was torn out of his loom. His wife ran to the door with her baby in her arms, shouting at the top of her voice, <coughs> My children have been murdered. Then the bailiffs knocked the house down to the ground. In other houses, the bailiffs had to grab the women and use the strength of their arms to put them outside. One woman threw herself on the floor, went into a swoon, and began to scream and screech and yelp like a dog for ten minutes. This reference has a personal connotation for me. The woman who went into a swoon was one of my ancestors, and I feel like screaming and screeching when I think of it, but I won't inflict that on a nice audience like you. Second section of the book starts with an account of Kenneth the Seer, Kenneth Oer, a famous prophet born in the Isle of Lewis at the beginning of the 17th century. Now, I was also born in the Isle of Lewis, but I can't even remember things, far less predict them. Among Kenneth's prophecies was the clearances. He's purported to have said, the day will come when the jawbones of the big sheep will put the plough on the roost. The old aristocracy will leave the land and be replaced by lowland merchants. All of the highlands will be one large deer forest. The country will be so short of people and so deserted that a cock crow cannot be heard north of Dromochter. The people will emigrate to distant islands that cannot be seen today but are found out in the Atlantic. After that, the deer and the other wild animals will be destroyed and drowned by the dark elements. Then the people will return and take possession of the land of their ancestors. Largely true, but partly false. I think the Brian Seer would have made an excellent political speechwriter. If he was alive now, he might have been recruited by your own Prime Minister's office to prepare today's speech from the throne. <laughs> in the next section of the book, Blair goes on to describe his journey to Canada in 1846, his sub sub subsequent travels in mainland Nova Scotia, Cape Breton and Prince Edward Island, and his trip to Upper Canada in 1847. His voyage across the Atlantic took 39 days and included several storms and being stuck in the ice for six days near Cape North. 
His journey to Upper Canada, or Ontario, was also hazardous. The ship went aground in the St. Lawrence and had to be abandoned. And here's a bit of that story. We all got ashore safely, and there was no loss except that of the ship, for the Lord was gracious to us and delivered us from the danger. When the sailors had dried themselves, they went out to see the ship, which was almost dry on the shore after the tide had ebbed. They brought back all they could manage. Among other things, they brought back two chests of mine containing my clothes, but on the ship they left three chests or boxes containing my books, and they refused to go back to fetch them. I was very indignant about that, since we were staying in this place for a couple of days. When we boarded a damaged ship full of wood that was going to Quebec to be repaired, I, I left behind a young fellow called Alistair Ross of Sutherland Extraction, and he undertook to stay where the wrecked ship was so that he could take my books when he got a chance to board another ship going to Quebec. The young fellow eventually delivered the books to him, and Blair paid him $18 for his trouble, but uh, he said that the books were worth over $100, which would have been a large amount at that time. But the question remains is why was he taking these chests of books with him to Ontario? Did he intend to stay there? Well, he didn't. He came back to Barney's River. The third section of the book has nine of Blair's poems. And in the first one, called Asherina Gaeltoch, The Resurrection of the Highlands, he predicts, The gales will rise again, they will not be in torment any more, bereft under the feet of mercenaries, as weak, powerless wretches. People will traverse the hills and the straths of many glens. Women and children will be seen reveling in dance and music. Although optimistic about the future, he is sad about what has happened to the highlands of Scotland, and he says, where the gospel of grace was sung to us in fellowship, as people gathered at prayer time together on the Sabbath, you can only hear the hollering of deer as they bellow on every slope and hill, and the barking of dogs on the moor, where psalms used to be sung. In July 1851, he composed a song called Madi Luroch, Lovely Mary, and he composed it in Iona when he returned from Canada to Scotland to marry Mary Sibylla MacLean. And in the song, he is pleading with her to come back with him to Barney's River. And he says, Come with me without delay. Leave your dear mother, your sister, and your brother and all your beloved friends, and come over with me to America of the Trees, a large and splendid country, even if it has no heather. So she came back with him to Barney's River. And the last poem in the book is Duncan Blair's best-known composition and a Gaelic poetic masterpiece. It's called Es Niagara, Niagara Falls, and he wrote it during his visit to Ontario in 1847. Now, unlike Oscar Wilde, who described Niagara Falls as the second greatest disappointment in the life of a newlywed, <laughs> Blair is lavish in his praise of Niagara Falls. Of course, he wasn't there for his own honeymoon. He chose the island of Iona instead, which was a good decision. And he concludes the long poem, Es Niagara, with the words, Aketvig mile chenkam veil, chanishin ule nihindish ehedinyesat, marshin squidim, which means, even if I had a thousand tongues in my mouth, I could not describe all the wonders of that waterfall. Therefore, I will finish, which is a perfect cue for me to do the same thing and stop this speech from the throne. <laughs> Thank you for listening so patiently. <laughs>
بشد مراوت